Gerd, Jan und Michael. Yes, good evening everybody. Um, I'm presenting here as a parent who is concerned about the use of um, um, well, digital tools within uh, education. I'm also standing here on behalf of my wife, Maike, who unfortunately couldn't have been here, would have been a wonderful presenter as well. Um, I have no uh, IT background for myself. I am basically uh, in development finance, and my wife is in uh, children and adolescent psychiatry. But we have two kids, six, uh, seven, I should say, sorry, seven and nine, who go to primary school here in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you a bit about how we became involved with uh, this initiative. Let me do that. Um, so this is basically what I uh, just um, mentioned. Um, Let yeah. me introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kurt Jan. I'm a work as a, I do work in IT. Uh, I'm a network designer for uh, mainly telecom, opera uh, telecom operators. Uh, at home I own six computers, well actually a bit more, but uh, depends on how you count. Six of that I use often, two daughters and one wife. So. Uh, I'm a long-term long -term, uh, open source supporter and, uh, and a privacy activist. I'm also active for the Pirate Party in Delft. Uh, one of the photos you see on the slide is the, um, as, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with the small balloons. That's a security camera with a party ha hat on it for uh, George Orwell Day that we celebrated. Um, I also do some sports, like uh, mountain biking. Uh, used to do triathlons, but now it's mainly mountain biking. So, that's me. Yeah. Michael, so, please uh, continue. Uh, with yeah, thanks. So, how we got introduced as parents to digi digi digitization in schools was basically when uh, COVID started and our kids came home with uh, two Google accounts uh, for, for each of them, naming their per made in their personal names, and, and basically, yeah, you know, administering, uh, you know, things uh, about them at school, which was uh, new to us. Um, so then uh, we, uh, you know, asked the school, you know, wh wh why is this now being done? Because before that, the school had not been digitized that much. And basically, the response we got from the school was, well, the kids need to work with this because they need a job after a while. Uh, they are basically safer using Google than using a standalone computer with a USB uh, stick. Uh, and it is all, uh, you know, privacy compliant. And we have a contract with Google to keep us safe. And basically, the last comment made me think back of my first contract with Google when I became a proud user of Gmail, and they said they would never look at my emails to provide me with marketing materials. And, and by now, they're scavenging every corner of my inbox to, to show me advertisements, of course. So um, the school was actually very helpful because they said, we will delete your kids' accounts and we'll make aliases uh, for them. So they're now named after, um, um, you know, cartoon figures uh, at school. Uh, but still, it, it, it is a bit worrisome to us that, that this is just being used with, without a, a, a clear reason, at least, uh, to, uh, to us. Um, and soon we noticed that, that more and more accounts were, um, were being um, made. Um, so at the moment, there's about eight uh, sort of digital tools the school uses for varying things like doing school exercises, like, uh, um, you know, having video metrics about how they move around uh, during uh, gym, gym lessons, exercise uh, lessons, and uh, of, of course, you know, using Google as a, as a general tool also for video meetings. Uh, there's also a fully digitized school report, uh, which you know, shows everything and, 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 and presents everything around the kids, uh, which can be accessed by uh, not only us, but, but, but others as well. And there's a lot of WhatsApp use at, uh, at school at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, a, a bit of a worry to us as well is that there seems to be a 
a collective unawareness of the risks of, uh, of using uh, all these tools. They're, of course, very handy and very practical, but at the same time, you really see that, uh, you know, school doesn't really, you know, lecture the kids on it by saying, for instance, you know, when they go through uh, what to do when, when to log into an app, they say yes and accept all cookies. And when there was one app that um, uh, needed a password, they had the list of all the you know, kids in the class, and uh, they made uh, some, um, some usernames for them and password, and they sent the list of the 31 people, 31 kids in the class, to all 31 kids with all the passwords. And this was a tool that was, that was also linked to, you know, the general education system in the Netherlands. So it was, uh, it, you know, it, it just shows that school is also, and very understandably, not really on, on top of things. Um, so what did we do? Well, every school in the Netherlands has a privacy official, and, and basically that's a person who doesn't work for the school, but, but is, a, is a hired lawyer, basically, who represents the school when there's questions about privacy. So we, we asked him, but basically he didn't know anything about the school because he probably had 50 schools to, uh, to help on these kind of matters. And uh, the next step we took was to ask uh, or sent, you know, requests to uh, to the providers of the of the services, digital service to the school, about what data was stored of our kids, and for what purpose. Um, the response was that some of these, you know, parties they 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 gave us a call and they said, well, we were actually storing lots of data, and are you from the media, and what should we do? Because uh, they, they were a bit panicky, but they said we will delete all this excess information, they had years of data stored, well, they can only store it for, for months, for instance, but they were actually very helpful. Then there were other parties who uh, responded by saying, well, you have to go to your school because we're only the, the data processor of this uh, data. And then there was Google who just never gave a reply at all. So we were, we were in sort of a situation where school was doing this and some other parties were pointing at the school. Some parties who did actually respond said they were sort of breaching, breaching it but, but tried to amend it. And then the biggest one, Google, yeah, was a bit of a question mark. Um, yeah, thanks. So, you know, basically because of that, we, we, we were actually quite, uh, quite concerned because, you know, first of all, you know, the school should be a very safe place for kids, also for their data, but it's also a very good place for parties to potentially gather data. You know, if, if, if these kids are filling in everything, if they have to fill in what they're afraid of, if they had to do exercises on it, there's a lot of data being collected from these kids, and you just want to protect them against uh, parties that are just collecting all that data to, to create profiles. Because with these profiles, you never know what they'll actually be doing with it. Um, and they, you know, the only thing Google, I think, promises is they won't use it for marketing. But there's, there's of course, they can change it one-sided. And then at the same time, you know, there's lots of other things they might use it for. Uh, and we would like our kids to have to write a resume the next time they want a job instead of, uh, you know, employers just Googling them. Um, and there might also a bit of a, be a bit of a risk of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you, if you have a profile that is really, you know, this kid is good at that, then you might actually be steered by IT or whatever to, to get more involved with that. And yeah, yeah, and you, you also don't want that. Then there's, of course, vendor lock-in. Because when a school is using a certain tool for a long time, you know, that school like me, I still have my Gmail account. I, uh, I'm, uh, so the school will probably use that service for a, for a long time. And actually, w you know, they can one-sidedly one um, change the, the terms of use, which is, which is something they could use to actually work these profiles a bit more and extract more value out of it, because they, they offer this service for almost nothing. It is, it is I think, 10 euros per kid to use the software and to have sufficient computers in a, in, in a class to be, to be using this, which cannot be the cost to Google of offering this service, I believe. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a basic right for kids to, to make their own mistakes, but also to be forgotten, especially at, at that age. Um, yeah, and, and we also think that, you know, digitization in, in education maybe 
researched a bit more bef before being used at such an extensive scale because we think face-to-face -face, uh, education is uh, something that might really work, work well. And the school, yeah, like I said, is, is very understandably also not really on top of things, you know. So they, they teach kids about the dangers of social media and, and you know, things like, uh, I don't know, sexting or people making misuse, but, but the danger of using digital services without really knowing what is being shared is, is not really something that is uh, done. And, and there's lots of cool things that kids could do with digital stuff, like programming, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and just, you know, being more creative, which is, which is not really done yet at school. So we think, uh, yeah, we, we were a bit concerned, and that's how we sort of joined the coalition for uh, uh, honest digital education. Which, uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, some people, um, people came together. Um, we started on the Forum of Freedom Internet. Uh, there were lots of people that were worried about what's going on in schools and where the data was going and who had access and why. Um, so, but instead of all being angry, uh, we, we decided to well, uh, just let's do something. Let's try to fix it. And um, from there, we started with the Coalition for Fair Digital Education. That's uh, in Dutch, uh, Coalitie voor Eerlijk Digitaal Onderwijs. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, we're not alone. Uh, can you do the, the, do the clicky? Oh, put it back. We have quite some um, organizations that are supporting us in this, uh, in this mission to, uh, to, to take back the educational system from, uh, from big tech, basically. Um, I'm not going to name them all, but some... Exp uh, <coughs> and just a few examples that... Um, um, for instance, Free Software Foundation that, that is uh, is quite quite uh, involved. Uh, Freedom Internet because we started on the on the forum of uh, of Freedom Internet, and in, uh, a couple of co a while ago we launched our uh, petition on uh, the conference of uh, public spaces. Well, first something about the Dutch digital, uh, not about the Dutch. Uh, educational system because it's slightly different than uh, in the most uh, European countries. We have in the Netherlands uh, we have the freedom of education. That's basically um, that the school does pay for the uh, for, for the school. The, uh, government is paying for the schools, but the schools organize themselves. Or basically, it's a way for confessionalists to do their own kind of uh, indoctr indoctrination. Uh. Um, sometimes I have sources in uh, links to sources in this documentation uh, in this presentation that are not in English, but you can use a service like Deepol for that. Okay, what's wrong with surveillance capitalism? Well, a lot. It's basically a threat to our democracy. If we want to have a free society, a free and liberal uh, liberal society, in democratic society, we cannot have surveillance capitalism. It's a problem that's growing. It's uh, feeding uh, polarization. Algorithms are optimized for, uh, for, for engagement instead of, so they try to track your intention as long as possible. The entire business model is based upon uh, collection, collecting harvesting data, extracting conclusions about, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, making conclusions about uh, the data they gathered and combined and uh, all together. And what's also wrong is it's a privatization of uh, collective effort. Let me explain that. If we all together uh, train some kind of uh, train an algorithm, uh, then the result of that training should be uh, belong in the public domain and not uh, be part of uh, some kind of big corporate. And also, the long-term consequences for kids are not very clear. Big tech clouds are far from free software. You can't really see what's happening in the in the cloud. I'm sorry. Um, they're not used. You you can't. Okay, free software is, uh, b gives you free four freedoms. None of those four freedoms are available f uh, in the cloud because you can't download the software, you can't use it for any uh, any purpose, you can't modify it, you can't uh, uh, you can't adapt it and redistribute it. If we want to uh, want to have all these possibilities, we should be stop using uh, big tech clouds. Also, important reminder: 
there is no cloud. There's just computers of someone else. And you can rent capacity there and deploy uh, some software or get some default uh, services. Uh, yeah, but it, there's no real cloud. It's in the end, it's just computers somewhere else. OK, let me do a quick introduction of the GDPR, because that's quite an important uh, topic in this, uh, uh, in this matter. For processing data, you have uh, six uh, legal grounds for which you can uh, process data. First is consent, that is if you agree to, uh, uh, that your data is used for a certain purpose. But the problem with consent is that you can always withdraw at any moment. So that's not a, uh, not a very useful basis to process data if you want, if you, if you basically, if you're a school, you can't suddenly stop processing. So that's why schools never ask for, uh, for consent. Um, second one is if we make an agreement. For instance, if uh, I'm a worker as a network designer, if I make a design for you, then I can send you an invoice. I don't need to have your uh, consent to, 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 to be able to send the, uh, send the invoice to you. Excuse me. Um, there's also law, uh, lots of laws that make that require that you s uh, send data. Uh, the fourth is vital interest. If you're dying somewhere, I don't need to ask your consent to check your blood type or some, uh, something like that. Um, there's common interest. That's mainly the government that's using that for, uh, for for processing data. For instance, if a municipality wants to hang cameras in the public space for, for security, that's com based upon the common uh, interest. And you have the legitimate interest. That is, if I make a balance between your privacy and my, uh, my interest, for instance, if I run a web server, it produces logs. I can keep those logs because that's uh, in my interest to be able to, to do troubleshooting and stuff like that. That can be based upon legitimate interest. But well, the problem with surveillance capitalism is that complying is not a real business interest. You can make more money if you do not comply and try to stretch the GDPR as far as possible. I see mainly three large problems with, uh, with the GDPR. First of all, uh, there's the consent. What basically comes down is that you have all these annoying cookie banners that you have to click on, uh, on OK, or you're being tricked in clicking on OK. And if you, if you would want to read it, uh, there's a lot of legally, uh, legalized uh, stuff that's very hard to read, and you don't have the time. And even if you have the time, it's the, uh, it's, they're not very transparent in what's actually done. So it's difficult to see uh, what, is this, uh, what, what the consequences of it are. Um, authorities are very understaffed and underfunded to properly enforce the GDPR. And what is important in, uh, in schools with the GDPR is that your parents are allowed to know almost everything until your age of 16. So, can you do the next? Um, well, the enforcement. Authorities are, uh, are under, understaffed. It's not that they don't want to enforce, but they don't have the budget, they don't have the staff. And in my opinion, they should also be more clever in automating things on how they... Uh, I mean, you can... For a nice example is all the security cameras that everybody just hooks up, points at, uh, at the public streets. That's not allowed to do that on the, in the GDPR, especially not if you did not properly secure it. It's a Chinese camera, uh, <coughs> etc. But what the author the authority authorities are doing is uh, responding to individual complaint about a specific camera. Well, you have on OpenStreetMap, you have thousands of cameras that are already there, and you can see that, uh, <coughs> that they're pointing on the, on, on the street. You can automate that. You can send everybody automated the warning, but your, your camera is not compliant. <coughs> um, another very important thing is uh, privacy by design. That's part of the GDPR, but it's not enforced at all. I mean, you can't call all the Google services privacy by design. They're, I mean, they're data extraction and profiling by design, and then try to make a make a um, uh, make a juridical 
the juridical uh, documents to make it seem compliant to the GDPR, but it's not. It cannot be, because it's not privacy by design. Privacy by design is that you collect only data you really need, delete it when you don't, uh, don't need it anymore, and protect it very, very well. Another nice example is uh, those advertising IDs. They promise in a legal document that they won't be building profiles, but in schools, even the, um, uh, the Chromebooks and Microsoft computers, they still have an advertising ID. And you can uh, reset it if you do that, which but maybe someone occasionally does, but yeah, uh, the profiling just continues. Uh, luckily, we're not alone in this uh, in this battle against uh, uh, for 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 better privacy enforcement. There's uh, none of your business, the organization by uh, Max Schrems. They're still doing a tremendous job in uh, using automated tools, also automated tools to uh, basically uh, have here the cookie uh, cookie banners. This is a cookie uh, banner with a with a dark pattern. There's a uh, highlighted green button that you're supposed to click immediately because that's the most easy solution. And if you want to reject it, you first have to open the policy and then maybe do, do another dozen clicks as opposed to this is the way you should do it. If you use cookies for more than strictly necessary, you just click on reject all if you don't like to have that. Um, <coughs> but this the, the fun thing about this project is they automated it. They sent, th they sent thousands of, uh, they scraped the most popular uh, websites in the, uh, in the, uh, that are used in, in the EU and send, send them automated warnings for your, your cookie banner is not compliant. And the consent. This is a nice uh, button. So you get again, kind of, uh, uh, for instance, the uh, let's stick to the cookie banner uh, example. If you open the the, uh, the 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 terms and conditions of the privacy statement, you get a lot often very complicated to read, very long document with a lot of blah blah. You you don't have the time. If you had the time, you probably don't have the juridistic. You, um, uh, the le legal knowledge to fully understand it, and maybe you don't have the technical uh, understanding of what exactly can be done with data. So what do you do? You click the accept button. Like everybody does, because you can't read all of those documents, it's too, too much. And they made it very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to read all this stuff. Uh, let me grab a bit of water. Well, there are some shortcuts you can take. Um, if you read a, uh, a privacy statement, there's a few things you should, should be looking at. First thing is, we don't use the data for. Well, I don't care what you're not doing, I want to know what you are doing, because if you don't uh, the, the things they've described that they're not doing, that's all, always the very bad thing that, uh, that, that you uh, think is very good that they're not doing it. So you're, uh, you're, com you're, you're feeling a bit more comfortable. Another nice one is, for example, we use the data, for example, to provide you this website. No one's going to object that. <laughs> but the thing is, that's, that's this is not complete. It's just an example to make you feel good, but the other things are not told. Um, also, a nice one is in the end. Probably you've uh, you've all, all seen that. Uh, this statement can change all the, uh, can change any time. So if it can change any time, you've been reading it, and then it says uh, it can, can it can change every time. So what's the point in reading it? The moment I click it away, it could be changed. And then you need to check again and again and again if you change it. But they should be informing me that something has changed. Um, another one is uh, selected business. We don't sell your data. We only share it with selected business partners. You can translate that as just anyone who wants to sell it, who wants to buy it. So that's bad. Fortunately, there's also examples that 
do good in how the uh, uh, our privacy statement looks like. A good privacy statement is short, simple, and understandable. Uh, it comes down to we use your data. To, uh, we use your data to provide you this and this service. That's it. Well, there's a few companies that have nice examples about that. I won't be standing in front of that. Uh, one I love, one, one that I love uh, really much is uh, is this one. It's an open cut. That's a security scanning tool that uh, Breno de Winter uh, in um, in the Corona Corona pandemic made to scan all the uh, testing streets for uh, for compliance and for security. This is the entire uh, privacy statement of the website about this tool. It's so short, it just fits in two languages on a single slide. Basically, it's in Dutch, it's a one-liner. In English, it's, uh, it became, became two lines. But that's really how you should do it. Don't collect more data than you need. And then think really good about what, what you actually need, not collecting things that might come in handy. Then the GDPR age. It's legal, uh, if, if you're under 16, it's legal that all your, your parents know everything. But if you ask a kid, um, if, if he likes it, if ask a 13, 14 year old, if he likes it that, uh, that his parents are immediately informed if he was late in school, did not make his homework, forgot his book, etc. But in Netherlands, 80% uh, of the secondary schools use Magister. That's a tool to track uh, if you're not late, made your homework, book forgotten, all your grades, etc. And they have a very handy app for parents that you get immediately ping if something, uh, some new information is added. <laughs> well, and the default setting is that parents can see everything. Only school, uh, school really needs to change this default setting to not informing the parents immediately if they want, want to have that. But legally speaking, there's no problem because you're under 16. Um, so a little bit more on uh, on Magister. It's basically a student or a pupil tracking system with a big centralized database. The problem with the, with this very big centralized database is that um, it's it's basically um, the information of an entire generation and their uh, school behavior is in one database. So if you want to know something about someone. You know it's in that database, probably. So uh, there's all kinds of foreign uh, uh, three-letter agencies that are very interested in knowing very much about uh, specific individuals in, individuals in uh, uh, fr from a country. Uh, can you put that one back, please? So. The question you should be asking is not the chance that this interest falls on your kid. It's maybe very small, but um, in the entire population, there will be kids that are uh, that will attract attention. Maybe because they become a terrorist or a criminal, but maybe they bec because they become a politician or a negotiator or a CEO of some company. Then suddenly they have uh, the interest of uh, secret services from abroad. This Magister has 80% uh, uh, apart from privacy in the data collection and uh, centralization. It's also a huge vendor lock-in. It's quite difficult to migrate to some kind of other uh, system, and it's hugely overpriced. If you look at the market share, it's uh, around 70 to 80%, but we have 900,000 uh, kids that are going to secondary school. If you calculate that with the price per year, that they're doing, that's 12 million uh, per year. So imagine if those schools would put this money together and rent a development team instead of keep paying licenses year after year after year that with prices that keep increasing and increasing. Well, we talked a lot about uh, privacy now, but privacy is a lot, is is a very important uh, uh, public value. But there's more public values. So please discuss with your neighbor what other public values there are than uh, than only privacy. 
Can you take two minutes to really think about that? Anyone who wants to share some? Uh, anyone wants to share uh, other public failures that are uh, important in to have in schools? You want to learn from it. Yeah, you want to study the code and learn from it. So that's transparency. You want to see what's happening in the cloud. Good. Anyone else? Political views. What's yeah, so political views because children are immersed in uh, certain ideas and yeah, and they don't want anyone to know that. But that's again privacy. Uh, again, I won't. Uh, anyone else? Also need to go on because we're uh, equality. Yeah, that's a good one. It's on the it's on on the list here. But in it, um, public domain. If you create something, if you if you train an algorithm, you do that with a million people, then the results of the algorithm that should be public domain. Also, autonomy is very important. How can you be yourself if you wonder what this algorithm is learning about you? I mean, you go to school to learn that you as a uh, as a student that you learn but not that the algorithm is learning about you. That's the other way around. Also, equality. There's lots of um, uh, adaptive uh, learning systems, but they mainly work very well for children that are already motivated and very good in self-disciplined and working. Not for the other ones, because there's so you I increase the, the, the gap between the already motivated good Good, good students versus the one that need a, need a little help and a, and a bit of a push. Um, it's also, if all this knowledge and all this power of an entire generation is in, uh, uh, is in the hands of a few, if, of, for a very few uh, small group, and then that's a threat to democracy. If you know so much about so many people, it's very easy to manipulate, to transport, uh, pump around fake news to gain their attention, to hold their attention, to push their attention to where you want to have it as an as a organization. So who owns the spell checker? I'd say if it's public effort, it should be public benefit. So Google and Microsoft both have a really good spelling checker, but it became so good because they harvested all our corrections. So why isn't it a public domain spell checker? Schools should be a safe space. You should be feel, you should be feel free. You should not be wondering what uh, um, uh, what the algorithm is learning about you. I'm going to for the time. I'm going to skip a few slides. Uh, uh, democracy, no, I'm not going to skip, but that's a very important one. The people that stormed the Capitol on 6th of January, those were peop people who were using uh, Facebook groups, they were using YouTube, uh, and YouTube also provides you with a next more radical, more uh, uh, movie. As soon as you're interested in a certain, uh, certain subject, you continue uh, it will continue to provide you with more and more of this uh, on the on this subject you, you're chosen going into. Uh, transparency we already had. In summary, GDPR is good, but it should be enforced, and it's not enough because it's not the only public value you have.
privacy is important, and that's what the GDPR is doing a good thing. But we should have um, schools should look at the entire package of public values, not only privacy and not only GDPR compliance. It matters what you teach children. If you teach children to use all those services of surveillance capitalists, then that's what they'll use. As soon as, even if you, within the school, make sure that everything is legally compliant and you assume that they even, although they're in the business of stretching the GDPR and expanding their space to use data as much as possible, as soon as the school bell goes, they'll pick up their phone and accept any terms and conditions that are, that are uh, connected to that. And now they won't read the policies then, because they learned in school that these are good services, this, this, this is what you can use. I'm going to skip this one as well. Kennisnet is also having uh, quite some good recommendations on how you can use uh, Google and Microsoft products in school. But it's also very impractical for a school. I mean, um, then you have a computer that can do all these fantastic things. And we as a population made, for instance, the spelling checker very good. But then you read the recommendations of, uh, of Kennisnet on how to use it privacy friendly. And then you cannot use the spelling checker. I mean, that's absurd. We made it. And now we can't even use it. Because then our privacy would be violated. And it's not according to the GDPR. Another one is for Microsoft. Um, you must make sure that in the entire school, nobody is going to install a mobile app. You should only use the desktop. <laughs> the, these, these are recommendations from, uh, um, from Kennisnet on how you can work GDPR compliant. So that's not the way uh, we should be going. Well, are schools nuts that they give all the data of the children away? No, they don't have the time, knowledge, and money to build their own environment. So we should be helping uh, uh, them, them with that. And the good thing is, we don't have to start from scratch, because there's lots and lots of very good open source tools. The only thing is that they're, um, they're not yet integrated in a complete package that can go to school. This is an example of, um, uh, of a German uh, organization, uh, Univention, that do identity and access management, and they link to lots of other open source uh, tools. So you can, you can, you can re it's really doable to b base your uh, digital system completely upon open source tools. This is another example that I'll skip. So what I want to do, is make sure that out of all these building blocks, we get it, to get it together and make a nice package that we solve the problem for the school and make it easy, that they can get a service, get service and the SLA and support and integration and training for a fixed price for, for, per, per, uh, per, per student or per pupil. Well, we have three ways of doing that. First is, um, well, let's just build it. Let's show it on a few schools that it is possible and doable. And then uh, lobby for political, political attention to get, uh, get support for this. And also legal by make sure, making sure that GDPR is, is properly enforced. Well, how are we going to build that? It's a matter of looking abroad. I mean, in Germany, in Luxembourg, in France, there are all fantastic uh, uh, deployments with, uh, with Nextcloud, but also other uh, open source tools that are used in school on a very large scale. So it's, it's possible and doable. Roughly, there are four parts to a school and IT environment. You have the generic. A uh, generic cloud environment, you have the uh, student administration, you have the hardware in class, and you have the educational material. Uh, 
currently we have a, we're doing a pilot in two schools in uh, Amsterdam. Those are primary schools. They have a next next cloud as a um, as an IT environment and all the um, uh, communication with uh, with parents is uh, using Signal for that. Um, Nextcloud is done by one of our supporters with the, from uh, the Nextcloud. Uh, yeah, that's it. So next step is we have a petition on um, uh, eerlijkdigitaalonderwijs.petities.nl. You can scan, scan this QR code or go to the URL directly. I'll get, give you a bigger one. Sorry, was there a question? Okay. But there's also other good news on the legal uh, le legal side of things. Uh, last week, Denmark has forbidden uh, the use of Google products in Google Workspace in the municipality of uh, Elsingor, but they've done that on a very generic base. Uh, the ground for this is that data transfers from Europe to the USA are not allowed, and that's applicable for a lot of other uh, of these uh, surveillance capitalists. Also, uh, Office 365 is the authorities have said that that's not usable for in schools in uh, uh, some Dales, uh, parts of uh, of Germany. Um, yeah, next thing, how do you get that done in the Netherlands? So, if you're a lawyer, please join us. So, how can you help? There's a Matrix chat room about this. Uh, uh, so, please join it if you're on Matrix. If you're not on Matrix, please come on Matrix and join the chat about uh, this subject. If you work for or, for a for a, uh, for an NGO or organ organization that's doing anything in the digital field, so please join us too. But then, as an organization, uh, sign the petition. After you've read it, of course, because you have to read things before you click. <laughs> and most important, if you if you have a school or work for a school, let the school join. Say as a school that we want to have a digital environment that's based upon public values. So, anyone has a question? Just Enforcement is a large part of the whole GDPR shit. Are you willing to work for the uh, autoriteit persoonsgegevens, Scheert Jan? As what? As a lawyer or uh, as, a, as a techie? As a person who wants to automate the, the stuff you talked about. Uh, I'll consider it. <laughs> and the second question is, shouldn't we just hack Magister? Ah, but hacking, that's illegal. <laughs> it, would set, uh, it would give a nice candle, yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, do you think it is possible in now and five years to have open source solutions and service providers that are willing to, uh, nou ja, more in, in privacy matter and, and provide schools with the, the correct solutions to yeah, have the children the, the, the um, correct uh, Well, they better get started now, because in Denmark, those schools there, they have two weeks to ditch Google, and not years. I mean, two weeks. Imagine you're a school and you have everything on the Google workspace, and the authorities say, ah, now you can't use it, and in two weeks you should have deleted all your data. So, it's very wise to start now. There are open source solutions that provide the same uh, possibilities as Google uh, and Microsoft solutions to... It will not be immediately on par, but if you look at the uh, next, uh, um, for instance, Nextcloud, yeah, you have, a, um, you have a cloud environment where you can work, work together and you can have lots of plugins for, uh, for schools. Okay. It's doable. There's all, in Germany, there are already schools working. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of students that are being migrated from Office 365 to Nextcloud. Okay, thank and you. 
Yeah, it's possible. Would it be a good idea to teach the teachers? That's a very good idea. Yeah, can can the hackers help to uh, if they have children on school that they give the teachers a, a short course in in things like this? There's an organization in uh, Austria that has a very German name that I cannot go. That's exactly doing this. Is yeah. teach the teacher. Uh, one of the things. Sorry, then I'm finished. One of the things which should be clarified is that open source is not free. It, it does cost money. Yeah? It's not gratis. No. It's, free, it's free as in freedom, but not yeah, as free yeah. as in no money. That's true. You no, have you to have for to it. pay for the people who develop things, but it's open for, for improvements. Uh, so that, that's a big difference. They think that they get everything free, but it's not true. So um, let me just jump in here. So that the word you're looking for is chaos macht Schule. Chaos, chaos does schools. They go into schools and teach teachers and kids and parents about all things online, et cetera, et cetera. Like, whom do you trust on the web? How, what, how much information one you, do you want to give out? But that's not that's not no, uh, IT. You, that's not IT, IT, uh, IT but, education. Then you make it uh, an individual choice again. But what we want is that the board of the school says we are going to base yeah. everything upon these public values. Yeah. Yeah. And not only privacy, but also transparency, and democracy, uh, sovereignty. But I'm, I'm, I'm interjecting. It should be a and a between you and the audience. I'm sorry. I just wanted to help with the name. Carry on, please. Next question. Well, Thank thanks you. for the presentation. Um, when it comes to climate change, a lot of youngsters are very much aware that it's about their future. Are you aware of any pupil-driven efforts to make this statement of yours and do it in public, do it in their schools, do it at a, well, a juridical court? I don't know. Not organized, but... Um, I think that would be a very powerful statement. But, yeah, if yeah. you can help me to... to I, I mean, I talk to my own kids, but uh, usually only to... to to warn them about uh, the situation now, but I uh, don't hear much other uh, initiatives uh, from that, that are coming from uh, from kids. Uh, okay, thanks. Next, next question, please. We we have a few minutes. I want to get our in. Uh, I was wondering if legally uh, it's uh, the students or their parents can refuse the use of Chromebooks or Microsoft Online stuff uh, for schools or for uh, extra. Or, uh, activities just outside of schools. Is there a legal basis where they could say, no, I don't want to create a Google account or? No, because then you're, um, that's only possible if, if you would be based upon consent, but they just make an agreement to provide IT services and they have a processing agreement with those uh, provider of which they claim that it's legally okay, all, all okay. So as a parent, you have nothing to say in it unless you go to court and uh, proceed uh, all the way until, but that's, uh, yeah, then I, you have to take your, your school to court. But that's uh, not a really nice uh, solution. So the parents have to agree to the use of Google services when no, putting no. their children they, to school? or No, they, they don't. The, the parents do not have to agree because the school makes an agreement. Uh, yeah, the, the, no, well, the, as, a, as a parent, you have agreed that the school provides everything they need for education. And that is, of course, a very broad um, you know, understanding. And then the school says, we need Google services for education. And by that, you have consent at the, at the beginning of the year when you so, have enrolled your kids. So the school should make it of public before people register their kids there, that they will be, their data will be sent to Google. Should that be of, uh, yeah. explicit when people yeah, register their kids to school? It's, yeah, uh, you know, with our kids, uh, you know, th when they were at school, they introduced Google and they introduced seven other apps that, you know, so it's uh, then difficult. And they say, we need this for our education. So, so it's uh, difficult. Yeah. And I do have to interject here because we're running out of time. Please come up to the speakers afterwards, uh, grab a drink at the bar and discuss this further. I think it's a very important to topic. Please, uh, for the end, please give a warm round of applause uh, to Gert Jan and Michelle. Thank you very much.
Oh, thank you. Uh...